I learned about Michael Sandel through his TED talk, and I was just going to write TED, and I guess I'll write it in a funky color. <laughs> a really, really good way to practice your English listening and learn good content, because they have a lot of up-and-coming ideas, and once they're on TED Talks, lots of people are talking about them. It's, it's extremely popular. That's how I first found out about Michael Sandel, because I listened to his TED talk. I'm on TED's uh, mailing list so I get a newsletter and found out about it and I thought it was a great talk so as soon as I finished listening to it I ordered two of his books. This was about two years ago I think and I ordered them because I thought it would be good for freshman English. He has a lot of moral dilemmas that he discusses and the whole process of trying to decide in, when you have a moral dilemma that's what the whole thing is about. I think what I like best about the talk overall it was great because he handled it so smoothly. The whole event was run very smoothly and there was a lot of participation from the audience. But what I think I really liked best was at the end his conclusion. He said that a lot of people have the idea that the market should decide a lot of things. Just leave it to the market and it will be decided. Do people like to buy this? Well then we'll manufacture it and we'll allow it. If they don't like it then not. But he's saying there are a lot of important questions that we should do what first? Rather than just leaving it to chance in the market, what should we do? Anybody who went to the talk or watched it? I watched it on, online. Yes, yeah, Stanley? To, dis to discuss uh, the, the reason behind the, behind the, the actions that some people do. Why they do that? Um, in fact, they, they're there, are, there is some reasons behind that. Right. I think, to me, his biggest point was at the end. He said that for a lot of these questions, did everybody agree? Did everybody have the same idea? No. Very often it was half and half. Half for, half against. Which means that we need to talk about it. People who are informed and who care about an issue you need to do a little research on it, a little discussion on it, talk about it, then get together and have a big discussion on it. What do we want for our society? And think before we just leave it to the market and chance. It's, the thing is it's not left to chance. It's left to a number of things. It's left to people with power and money because they can manipulate events because they have money. In Chinese, what do you say? <laughs> right. So if you have money, you can do all kinds of things, but it doesn't mean that you have the interests of other people in mind all the time. You probably want to just forward your own agenda, advance your own, your own position. So we should not just leave it to chance because it's not chance at all. It's left to the people with power, people with all kinds of power and especially money. So we need to get together and think about things, carefully discuss them. A lot of things we can't think ourselves. We can't think of ourselves because we have too many blind spots. But in the process of discussing something, a lot of things will come up. You'll think, well, gee, I never thought about that. And then when we've really discussed it, thoroughly thought about it, then we make our decision. It seems that would be a much more informed way of proceeding rather than just letting whoever has motivation and money and power take over the decision for us. So I'll pass the books around. This is book sharing because it just came up last night. I didn't know about the talk, talk till about two hours before the talk. is Professor Thompson, Carol Thompson, he said, Karen, you used to work at the GIO. Can you get tickets? And I said, no, no, no. I don't have any connection there, and I don't think they would help me anyway. We found out there were no tickets available at all. And I said there were zero empty seats, but my student in freshman English said there was one empty seat. <laughs> Next to him, he said there was one empty seat. So it was thousands of people, I'm sure, thousands of people, and it was a great event. So I'll just share with you the books Justice, what's the right thing to do? And Justice, a reader. So have a look. I think these are very easy to get in Taipei. So if you're interested, you might consider getting them. I wouldn't bother with the library because at least nine people are in line waiting to borrow the book. You will never get it. So you might as well just buy your own copy or get it from somebody. 
If you have an e-reader, you can get an electronic copy, whatever. So I just wanted to mention that first. I think uh, Wendy performed admirably. She did a really good job. It was such a surprise, a very pleasant surprise. It was great. And another thing that we observed, Wendy and I were just talking, is that a lot of the people who have the courage and confidence to stand up and talk, what kind of background do they have? Besides being from China. <laughs> That's what my other students said. The people from the PRC in general were much more aggressive, confident, but they didn't always listen. They didn't always answer the question, but they got up and spoke with confidence. But in Taiwan, there's a group of people that tend to attend these events and get up and talk. Which people are they? Louder, Wendy? Model United people who, are, who participate in the Model United Nations. Have you heard of that? What's it called in Chinese? Yeah. So I have noticed that, not just recently, over many years, some of my students who are the most engaged, involved, and who like to speak up, they have been members of the Model United Nations. That's a good way to train yourself because you need to interact with people in English. You have to, or otherwise you're just out of the picture. Everybody ignores you, right? Okay, and so this is not totally off topic for all of you here who are learning English, who are majoring in English. This is one way to give yourself motivation because it seems to me it boils down to motivation. With my freshman English class this year, I've been doing different things. But I still have the same problem of they're doing what I assigned because I assigned it and they do it reluctantly because they don't like people telling them what to do. That's the way we all are, right? We don't like being forced to do things. So in the end, a lot of the things were things that I chose, and they do it, but it's just schoolwork. However, when you start to give people choices, they do something because they like it, because they think it's useful to them, they're usually much more engaged. So these people in the Model United Nations, they chose to do it, and they find that if they want to get any attention or if they want to be successful at all, they have to stand up, be brave, be confident, and use English. And you train yourself quite quickly, I think. You know, even if at the beginning you think you're, you won't remember your grammar or the words or anything, you just have to train yourself to get up and talk. Isn't that how it works? You think so? Ten minutes to prepare and one minute to talk. Pretty good training. Now, a lot of you, if you pushed yourself harder, you could do it yourself, but this is where the environment really pushes you and you progress fast. Okay, so I just wanted to share that with you. Um, again, does anybody have any back homework that you need to hand in? Anything that's missing? Bring yourself up to date as soon as possible. I have posted the link for the Jennifer Jenkins video. Have you all noticed that? If you haven't, please go to Facebook under NTU Phonetics. The Jennifer Jenkins video has been up for, I think, two days. In addition, I asked you about the neutral tone in the Southern Maine dialect. Did you do your research on that? Okay. okay. Do you want to share just a little bit, Jerome? Uh, what, what I found is that uh, we have neutral tones in uh, Southern Maine, and we use it to express something that it's like in, um, uh, because I found a, like a teaching website and the internet, and it said that sometimes we use it to express uh, some to express emotions or uh, to express that something is just uh, is just attached words to um, to make up a vocabulary. What do we call those? Something like I, I don't know if this is what you're talking about, but it sounds like you're talking about clitics. That's the plural. Clitics. Clitics are morphemes. They have meaning, but they can't stand alone. They have to be attached to something before them. For example, John's book. How many morphemes do we have in John's book? Anybody? How many morphemes in John's book? Three. John, z, soyoga, and book, right? Now, what is that z? What's the status of z? Sorry? It's a possessive, but is it a word? Is it a function word? When we think of word, we think of something that can stand alone. 
So that's where this comes in handy, this term. It's a clitic. It has to be affixed to something before it. It can't exist alone. But it has meaning. It's a very important part of the language. Is that what you're talking about or not? Uh, yes. And um, it's said that some, some, uh, some words may sound the same, but with a neutral tone, the meanings will differ. Like, gya uh, lang means dirty. But when we are say that how scary, we can say gya lang. Uh -huh. yeah. And the second word is a uh, neutral tone. Yeah. That's true. I'll give you another example. Say it in southern mean. Is that right? Are you sure? How good is your southern mean? Who has pretty strong southern mean? Someone from the central or southern part of Taiwan would be preferable. How about. That's one we usually say. Right, that's it. How does that sound to you? It sounds more uh, soft and not so strong. That's the point. That's where we're going with this. I'll give you another easy example. <clears throat> and this is something that I understand that Wai Shengyuan sometimes get wrong when they're trying to speak Minan Yu. Wai Li. There we go. It should be? Right. Wai Li. Xinxi. Ai is low falling tone, Ai. But if you say Wai Li, it's not wrong, but what does it mean? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> okay, think about that. Now that's a start. That's not everything. I want you to figure out what, not figure it out, you can look it up. But I also want you to introspect. If you know Southern mean, try a whole bunch of sentences like that or phrases like that yourself and see what happens if you use the full tone or if you use a neutral tone, because that's an example of a neutral tone. And I only gave you an example. I didn't describe the whole thing. So there's a lot about it you still don't know explicitly. You may say it correctly, but you don't know the rules. So for your notes for next Monday, I want all of you to write about the neutral tone in Southern Mean. Even if you don't know Southern Mean, still do the research. You can ask a speaker, but they can't tell you the rule normally because most people haven't studied them. So what you can do is find the information online and then find a native speaker, not just any native speaker, but someone who speaks it really well. Not who says something like, Xing Lin, the Lin, is the Xing Lin. How about the rest of you? Shang Mu Lin, Xing Lin, how do you say it in Southern Mean? Same as Mandarin or any different? Yes, you're good. Okay, Jerome's good. Anybody else? Xing Lin the Lin. How do you say Lin in in, in Minan Yu? What is the final consonant? There we go. Okay, in my whole class, in another class, everybody thought it was the same as Mandarin. Xing Xing Lin, and I was very shocked because it's an M at the end. Xing Lin. Lim. I used to live with a family named Lim, so I heard it a lot, and they spoke Minayu. I don't speak it well, but I definitely know that one. Um, so if you are not sure about Lim or Lin, then you may have other changes in your Minayu that are different from your parents and grandparents. It would be good to ask an older person, like if you have a grandma. Get your materials ready first. First do your research, have some sentences ready, and give different versions. Xiang you know, a comparison, and then see what your mean, Southern Mean speaker says. Okay? So for next week, everybody, I want notes on neutral tone in Southern Mean. Got it? Okay, I want you to find out about it and then test it out on yourself if you know Southern Mean or on somebody else if you don't speak that well or if you just want to confirm what you're, um, what you're looking at, the information you found. Another thing is, I was talking last time about how I know that there's a lot of stuff coming at you at once. It's a lot of information. We're going to have to finish another chapter very quickly. These last two chapters will be in the final exam with no chapter test. 
But I just want to mention that very often when you're learning, you have to do that with limited time. You muddle your way through, and then after the class is over, you've somehow made it through the final exam and gotten your final grade and credit. Then you go back and you learn it carefully. Because now I know a lot of you have a lot of subjects, a lot to do. Not that it's an excuse, but I know you're all really stressed and busy, probably anyway. So do your very, very best. Prioritize. Learn the most important things that we're doing now that you think you need to pass the tests and do the homework. And as for the rest of it, it's worth it for all of you, even if you don't take second semester, even if you don't go on in linguistics or phonetics at all. Make it through the semester and then go back and read it very carefully. It definitely will be Wen Guo Zhi Xin. You need to have all that stuff really clear in your head. It will be a huge advantage to you, no matter what you do, I promise you, it really will. So if you're feeling a little frustrated and suffering overload, do your very best and then after the semester when you have time and you're sick of sleeping and watching TV all the time during vacation, you can go back to your textbook and review it carefully bit by bit, okay? I think I mentioned that was my experience with Georgian. It was just too much at once, but I was only in Georgia for about a month and a half, so I had to grab whatever I could, even though I couldn't digest it, take it home, and then go over it bit by bit. And that's actually a good way of learning. And then do it again a third time. And by the third time, you probably will learn it pretty well. Most of us do not learn, I think probably anybody, it's, of, it's true of anybody. We don't learn in a linear fashion. It doesn't mean this bit of information, we've got that, let's take the next one, next one, and we've got it like a string of beads. It doesn't work that way. Our learning jumps all over the place, and then we start a, like a little colony here, and it grows and grows and grows, and then stuff over here is not familiar. We have to start a new colony, and eventually they can grow together and we connect it, and then it feels really good. So keep in mind that that will happen probably with all your learning. Be ready for that and have, and have a, a method for dealing with it, okay? I just wanted to mention that. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, do your best. Go back and review later. We are going to have to also copy the vowel allophones for this chapter. We'll have to finish it. It'll have to be quickly. We don't have many classes left. Remember, we have class on the 22nd. One advantage of getting through things quickly, I know I'm kind of taking a lot of time now lecturing. Um, if we have time, we will maybe have one hour of Christmas carol singing on the 24th, or just the how. So if, if we're doing okay, if it looks like we can finish in time, one hour of class on Monday, second hour, will be Christmas carol singing. Unless we're panicking and we don't have time, then we'll cancel it. But I think you would prefer to have the singing, right? I think it'd be fun because we'll try some unusual languages you maybe haven't had contact with before. Oh, and there's another very important thing. For this class, you will need to write a class evaluation. First of all, you know that you have to do a class evaluation for all your classes online, right? And absolutely do an evaluation for every single class you have. Don't be lazy about that. It's extremely important. You students now have a lot of power that you didn't have 20 years ago. You really do, because in the past there was no evaluation system, and there were a lot of teachers who got old in the job and were not very responsible. They're gone now, so I'm not worried about anybody hearing this. But at the time, it's true, and I don't mind saying this to the world on, on video. As soon as they instituted an evaluation system, they were gone, immediately, that year. So the people who are left were people who can pass evaluations, and they're all good teachers. You may not like every single teacher equally well, but Taida generally does not have bad teachers because they can't survive here. But we need to be evaluated frequently. We need to, a lot of us want to get ourselves promoted, and your feedback is always one of the references for anything that we do. If we want to get evaluated, if we want to get promoted, if we want to apply for something, they will often look at student evaluations. So you are really, really very powerful. Don't cheat your end. Make sure that you go online and do an evaluation for all your classes. In addition, you also need to do a written, it has, doesn't have to be handwritten, but you have to do another evaluation for this class that you give to me. You put your name on it, so you need to be a little bit kachi, that's all. <laughs> but be honest, criticisms are welcome. Negative ones are okay. All you have to do, besides being a little polite, is be constructive. That's the only thing. If you found something was really not helpful to you, spent too much time on something, was not explained clearly, whatever your complaint is, go ahead and put it in your evaluation. 
Um, just be constructive, suggest a way to correct it. And I will tell you how to structure your, evalu your evaluation now. You need to take notes. This is due by the last day of class. And that's something like January, what, 3rd? What is our last day of class? 2nd? January 2nd, OK. And you need to turn it into a PDF file and email it to my account, to Karchong. OK? This is what you need to put in it. Part one is you evaluate the class, everything about it, the textbook, the way it's taught, the lectures, even the OCW part of it being videoed, uh, the TAs, everything about the class, the discussion, the jin du, uh, the web pages, everything. Evaluate it, how helpful you think it was or how not helpful, what you think should be taken away, what should be added everything about the class. That's part one. Part two is evaluate yourself. How did you do in this class? How much effort did you put into the class? Did you come to every class? Did you come on time? Did you hand in your assignments? Did you put effort into your assignments? Did you prepare for the tests? How much do you think you learned from the class? What do you think you could improve in your own performance? What are you satisfied with in your own performance? So part two is all about you how you did in the class. That's part two. Part three is going to be a little bit bigger, but you should have ready-made materials for it. Part three is a sum of your notes. You need to put it into an electronic file, a Word file. You can just jint it, it's fine, but organize your notes. It'll be mainly about pronunciation, pronunciation rules, and things about phonetics. I want all of your notes organized into a set of master notes. Now, teeny tiny details you think are really irrelevant. You don't have to be that sheet. But the main points of your notes, especially things that you got corrected on more than once or that got mentioned in class more than once, anything you didn't know before should go in your notes. So part three is a summary of your notes for this class. Then. Actually, that should have been part four. Part three, we'll go back a little bit. Part three is your plan for how you can plan to continue improving your English. Because some of you are not going to take second semester. Some of you maybe will never have another oral training class again. How are you going to continue growing, improving your English and your knowledge of linguistics? So some of you may not want to continue in linguistics. So whatever it is that you need to keep on learning, Taida is not going to give you everything you need, not by far. You need to do it yourself. So that's actually part three, the first part. The, the sum is part four. So part three is how are you going to continue improving your English, learning more about phonetics, learning more about linguistics, growing intellectually, spiritually, everything like that. It doesn't have to be huge and comprehensive, but you need a plan for independent learning is the point. So it's, your, it's the beginning of a plan for your lifelong learning plan. OK? Is that all clear? It needs to be, you can type it into a Word file, change it to PDF. I want only PDF. And it can all go in one file. Well, no, actually, let's keep the evaluation in one file, master notes in another file, two files, sorry. yeah. So, evaluation, part one, two, three, one file. Master notes, second file, both in PDF. So send me an email with a nice little note. Here are my evaluation and my master notes, my summary of my classroom notes, my class notes, okay? Um, do you remember the recording you did way at the beginning of the semester? Okay, you still have it, I hope, right? I want you to, this is another part. You need to add this, you need to add this. Okay, you need to listen to your file again and write another ganxiang. Write another, another little essay of, of your own feedback, your own reaction to your recording after one semester in this class. I really did almost forget. In some years I totally forget, but I just thought of it now. Okay, so your feedback now after one semester of phonetics on the recording assignment from the beginning of the semester. Put that together with the evaluation. Put that together with the evaluation. So that's a lot of parts. Start on it early. 
You don't have to finish it right away, but do a little bit at a time so it doesn't just come down on you suddenly when you don't have much time, because I know that there's a lot of work that's falling due now. I would prefer that you write it in English. However, if writing in English means you only write a few sentences, but being allowed to write in Chinese means you would write a lot more, then I would rather you write more and you can write Chinese. I prefer you do it in English, but if there's a lot of things that you wouldn't say in English if you have to write it in English, then go ahead and write in Chinese. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Right, so I prefer English, but if you have a lot of things and you want to be really fluent and fast, go ahead and you can put it in Chinese. It'll just take me longer to read, that's all. Right, we're going to move on now to chapter four, and we will have you read a bit, but whenever I worry about time, I'm gonna start jumping in and summarizing myself. So our next reader last time was only Sherry, I remember, right? So our next reader, and remember to identify yourself still. We're going to start chapter 4, page 85, please. This is Justine. English vowels. Transcription. Oh, chap chapter 4. Did you say that? Oh, chapter 4. Everybody remembers that, but this is our last chance to do it this semester. So I won't nag you on that again. Uh, huh? Chapter 4. Mm -hmm. English vowels. Transcription and phonetic dis dictionaries. The vowels of English can be transcribed in many different ways. Partly because many different ways. Uh, in many different ways, uh -huh. partly because accents of English differ greatly in the vowels they use, and partly because there is no one right way. There is no one right way of transcribing even a single accent of English. Okay, sorry to stop you, but I want to mention two things. First of all, this is important. One reason why there are many different styles of transcribing English is because what? There are many different accents, and British English and American English differ more in vowels or in consonants? More in vowels. They also differ in consonants, but they differ much more in vowels. That's the first point. The second point is the third line. How do we stress that? I want you to think before I give you an answer. Because they're what? Yes, I heard one. Say it louder. Was that Amy? Who was it? Julia? Who was it? It's in that way. Go ahead. No one right way of transcribing even a single accent. Beautiful. What did you do at the beginning? One right way. That's exactly what you did. What did she do? She stressed every word and one more thing. Paused because there are only one syllable and they are all stressed. So we don't like too many stresses piled up together. There is no one right way of transcribing. We're being emphatic and they all have single syllables and they're stressed. So if you say, because there is no one right way of transcribing, your listener is probably not going to understand what you meant to say. Probably will not get it at all. And this is something we've mentioned many times, but here's a really good example of it. Single syllables with stress, stress them so that they're really clear and pause afterwards because we have no padding in between. There's no unstressed syllables there to pad them. There is no one right way of transcribing. Everyone try it. There's no one right way of transcribing. Beautiful. All right. And no one right. Don't say no one right. Watch that. No one that end. I didn't hear it wrong, but just reminding you. Very good. Continue. The set of symbols you mm, set, not sat. Set. The set of symbols. Use depends on the... <laughs> you have to read ahead to get the right phrasing. The set of symbols used depends on the reason for making the transcription. Did everybody catch that? The first time if she said, the set of symbols used depends, your listener again would probably not get it. The set of symbols which you use is what it means. The set of symbols used, big pause, depends on the reason. Go ahead. If one is aiming to reduce English to the smallest possible set of symbols, symbols, set of symbols, right? Then sheep and ship, Luke, sheep and ship, sheep and ship, Luke and look, Luke. And same thing, same pattern. Try again. Luke, Luke and look, Luke, Luke and look, 
who can look, mm -hmm. and all the other pairs of vowels that differ in length could be transcribed using one. Transcribe, pause, using is a new phrase. Yeah, new clause. Could be transcribed using one symbol per pair plus a length mark. One symbol per pair plus plus 等于是个连接词 right? It means and. So remember to pause before prepositions and conjunctions. Okay. As sheep, 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 ship. Ah,、uh, sheep, ship.、Mm -hmm. Look, look. All right. What are they doing here? They're using one symbol. We talked about this earlier, right? So, for I, you can use just one symbol. This is e, and this is i. We can use the same symbol. That's what they do in the DJ Daniel Jones system. And same with, actually, these are supposed to be triangles, but we just use colons. For u, length and u, no length mark. And how do we say length? Let's review length. Nice. Good. Okay. In this way, one could reduce the number of vowel symbols considerably, but. At the expense of at making the, the, at the, but at the expense of making the reader. Once more, expense. How many get asked? Could it be in voice, ma? At the expense of.、Mm -hmm. But at the expense of making the reader remember that the vowel pairs that differed by the use of the length. By differed by the use of the. That differed by the use of the length mark. Length mark. By the length mark. Also differed in quality. Very good. That's enough. All right. So we can reduce the number of symbols and make it a more economical system, but we pay a price. We pay a price for it. What is that price? Does it make more or fewer demands on the reader? We've made fewer demands on symbols. We can get by with fewer symbols. We don't need the symbol i, and we don't need the symbol u. We don't need these two symbols because we can just add a length mark to the to the other、uh, corresponding symbol, right? So we're making fewer demands on the number of、uh, symbols, right? We're using fewer symbols, but how about the reader? Are we making more or fewer demands on the reader? Because how are we making more demands on the reader? If we use this system. E, e. If we use this system, how is that making more demands on the reader? Alex? Quality. That's true. They have different quality. You're sort of getting to what I'm trying to trying to get at. What does the reader have to do? They have to know a rule, right? If you learn just this and this as separate symbols, you don't have to relate the two to each other. You don't have to think that these are basically the same sound, but two versions of it. This one is higher; it's longer; it's got a different quality here. This one's shorter、uh, and and lower, right? We don't really have to relate these two symbols to each other, even though they do sort of look alike. But we don't have to have the idea that they are related, closely related. But this system forces you. To put these into a pair that is closely related, and you have to learn a rule that turns i into e, because just following your previous habit from learning kk, what would you probably do when you saw this? You'd say e, and then you'd see this, and you go e, <laughs> right? But that's not the only difference. This is e, and this is actually i. So you have to you have to require that your reader learn a rule and learn how to turn. This, this into this with another with a diacritic. Okay, so that's making more demands on your reader. They have to apply a rule before they can read a symbol correctly. Let's go into the next reader, please. Wendy, a different approach which would be emphasize all the difference, which would be, which would a different approach which. Be to emphasize. Okay, this time the the two was correct, but your wood was sloppy. <laughs> One more time. Would be to、mm -hmm. emphasize all the differences between English vowels. Between and. Between. Right. English vowels. This would require noting that both length and length. lengths and 
quality difference occur. Quality what? Quality differences occur. Yes. Making sheep, sheep, the pre, the preferable cre transcription. Okay, stop for a minute. He says now that e and i is preferable because what? Gets back to what Alex was saying. He says that under certain conditions, this is a preferable transcription because why, Alex? That's right. We think of the quality difference and not just the length difference. This one suggests that length is the only difference, but this one reminds us that they also have a quality difference. Okay? Using this kind of transcription would hide the fact that vowel quality and vowel lengths are linked, and there is no need to mark both. In this book, in this book they, we have chosen to use the transcription that most phonetics instructors prefer and write sheep, 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 not sheep, right? It's sheep, 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 mm -hmm. leaving the reader to infer the difference in length. Okay, I made a mistake here because here they're doing two things. They're not just doing either this or this. They're doing this and this plus a length mark. So sheep would be like this, and ship would be like this. They're reminding us that this has a different quality and it is also longer. These dots are really hard to make here. All right, so sheep, ship, but in a way it's redundant. We don't need to give that much information because what do we know? If it is E, then we know it's we already know it's longer. If it's it, so we don't really have to put that length mark in there. That's what most systems prefer. That's what most textbooks prefer. That's what this one started out as. There was one edition where they switched to this system. So Latifogan himself was kind of teeter tottering back and forth, and then they switched it back to no length mark. And it was inconsistent, lots of typos. It was very inconsistent. So, 一下子是一跟一, And it was quite a mess. Now it's been mostly cleaned up, and they've gone back to a simple e and it, no length mark, unless we're doing a narrow transcription. Now, this may seem like a minor point, but it's actually pretty important because when you're doing a phonemic transcription, a broad transcription, do you want to have a lot of extra diacritics? No, you want to keep it straightforward. You only want the phonemes of the language, and then most of the allophones you should be able to figure out yourself, or most of the extra features. And this is basically an extra feature. They have different quality. In addition, this one's longer. And one problem, I think, in a lot of English teaching textbooks is they teach you long and short, but do they explain to you that they have different qualities? No. So many people are very confused because they sound different, but the book only tells you long and short. And you think that this is sheep, and this is sheep. <laughs> but it's not. Didn't a lot of you have that confusion before? Some of you? At least former students have told me that they really didn't know. It was not clear to them at all. So whatever you do, you, it's a trade-off. You're, you're going to win some and lose some. Maybe you'll make it more economical, but you'll make it a little harder to read or you won't show relationships between sounds, etc. So the point of this paragraph is you have many choices when you're transcribing any language. You always have choices. You have to decide what your purpose is and then choose a suitable transcription style. You may want to mark extra length or you may not, depending on your purpose. All right, we finish that paragraph. Next one, please, next reader. You, me. Using this simple style of, of transcription, which was introdu introduced in Chapter 2, carries a small penalty. There are some widely accept reference mm, books. Widely what? Widely accept. Mm? Accepted mm, How reference do you know it's accepted? Books. Because you got caught the first time. <laughs> so you tried something else. <laughs> do you know the rule? Do you remember the rule? Everybody, pay attention. Write it down if you still don't remember. Can you just kind of shout out the rule? When we add ed, when do we get an extra syllable? 
if the tsugan ends with T or D. Everybody, please remember that for the rest of your life. We've been over it many times. The article that I just finished for Shi De has this rule in it. I haven't given it to you yet. Just gang hao bei run wan le. Just yes, just today actually I got their email. Uh, they, finally, the editor says yes. We agree now. She made some changes. I made some changes back, and she said okay. That just happened today. So that article, maybe I will post it on NTU Phonetics. Please go to Facebook and look for it. I'll post it there. But it's it's very pre-publication. That's a Mingyan San Yue de Wenjiang. Remember that if it ends with T or D, add ud an extra syllable. What's the other rule? Other two rules? If it ends with a voiceless sound, then add t. If it ends with a voiced sound, add w. Mm, mm, right. Please remember that. That's a really basic rule. For plurals, make sure you know the rule as well. For plurals, voiceless becomes s. Voice becomes z, like beads. And then finally, which ones need uz, a separate syllable added? If it ends with a, they don't call it a strident. Sibilant, siin, right? Zuihogein. If it is s, z, sh, z, ch, j, then we add uz. If you don't remember that rule, please review it because those two are very, very, very basic. Okay, go on. Not exactly this style. One is an updated version of a of the dictionary dictionary produced by the English phon phonetician. Fa fa fa. Wait, that's not phonetician. It's fa phonetician. Yeah, Daniel Jones. Daniel, Daniel Jones. Jones. Daniel Jones, whose acute, mm -mm. whose acute, mm -mm. acute, mm -mm. try something else. Acute. Not. It's not at. It's a. There we. Yeah. Acute. Jianrei Acute. And also means jixing de, like acute appendicitis. Jixing. Huang Tang Yan. Man xing de is chronic. Okay. Acute. But here it means sharp. Go ahead. Whose acute observations of English, in and it's observations, not observations yeah. of English, dominated 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 British British phonetics in the first half of the 20th century. All right, please stop there. There's just a lot of information here on dictionaries. We're going to skip over it. You can read that yourself. It's just mainly a lot of information about people who compiled dictionaries and the names of the dictionaries and so forth. So the English Pronouncing Dictionary, the current edition, still has Jan Daniel Jones's name, but it's been revised by new editors, Peter Roach, James Hartman, Jane Setter. And I know two of those people online very well, and they turn up at phonetics con uh, conferences. And another authoritative work is the Longman Pronunciation Dictionary by by who? John Wells. We've talked about him before. He's on our NTU pronunciation. Okay? And he's, he's actually probably, he was just in Japan in Shanghai. I don't know if he's gone back to England yet. Even after his, his stroke, he, he got up and traveled and gave papers, so totally amazing. And it says that he holds the chair in phonetics at University College London, but he's now retired. And the rest is about authorities and dictionaries. Read that yourself. All right, we don't really need that. And it says everybody interested in English pronunciation should be using one of these dictionaries. They are excellent and they're very useful, especially if you get the CD with them. However, it's, already, it's also OK without them because you now have so many choices online, both British and American. And they're very reliable. They're very, very good. So although these are great if you're going to continue in phonetics, actually, the resources you have online are adequate. They're enough. She's a bushio. Mm. I want to also cover another point before uh, break. And it says in the second paragraph on page 86, the pronunciation that they show is the one typically used by national newscasters. They're talking now about American English. And we can call it standard American newscaster English. And for British, standard BBC English. Or we just say American English, British English, and we know what we're talking about. Of course, it's not 
clear if we just say those. We have to understand that it's a short, shortened form of or an abbreviation of Standard American Newscaster English and Standard BBC English. Standard BBC English is also called RP, Received Pronunciation. And I told you when we were talking about Professor Jenkins last time that she feels this is not a suitable model for people in their 20s. And in my discussion with my British teacher, of course, he belongs to my generation. He's a little older, actually. He feels that you still need a standard to aim for because we don't have something to replace it yet. If you learn directly from 20-year-olds, you're going to say one, two, three. And that's going to be wrong in a lot of contexts. They still expect you to speak in some kind of standard British. So as a foreigner, I still believe that RP is your best model for British. General American is your best model for American. When you go to the country, you can make your adjustments. You will know what's appropriate in the group that you hang out with. Make your adjustments. But start out with the Belgian, the Nizong version. Start out with a standard accent. This is my personal point of view. You can adopt another one. Other people will disagree with me. It's not popular right now. But it's one I strongly believe. Learn a standard version very well. And then you will have the power to pick up other versions very easily because you have a solid foundation. If you start picking up bits and pieces here and there, you will have a, a patchwork quilt. It doesn't belong to anything. And it will often confuse people because possible. Is it or is it We don't know. So this is just my point of view that I'm throwing in here. They're saying that um, these dictionaries allow you to compare British and American pronunciations. For example, it says that British speakers tend to say Caribbean, Americans say Caribbean, but this is not really valid all the time because I say both. Um, I say a Caribbean cruise. It sounds more romantic. I'll say the Caribbean Sea, but a Caribbean cruise. So often it depends on the context, and it has some kind of emotional a baggage with it for me. And it says that American college dictionaries will also give you pronunciations, but I think I may have warned you more than once. Don't bother with the inbiao of American published dictionaries because they are ad hoc. You will need to know this for the test. Please pay attention. Ad hoc means jiang jiu de, pin chou qi lai de, lin shi pin chou de jiang jiu de xi tong. Ad hoc, it means for this, basically. It's just for this particular purpose. Most American dictionaries do not use IPA. They use an ad hoc system. Every dictionary is different. And I really don't recommend even bothering with it. I can use it, but I have to look at the key every time. When I pick up a dictionary, we have to the key is what? And it's, it would be better if we used IPA, but America is America. They're not going to do it. So use a British dictionary. And they will also give you American pronunciations. However, sometimes they're wrong. I have found that sometimes their American pronunciations are not totally reliable. But usually they have Native Americans reading the pronunciation, so usually there's not a problem. In some written dictionaries, and so printed dictionaries, I have found little problems. Okay? Mm. And then it says, let's see. Um, American dictionaries often, cheng, they often say that they don't use IPA because the dictionaries are for people with different regional accents and they want everybody to be able to know how to read the words, but that's not a good example because IPA can be used to represent broad regions of sounds. So if we use the open O in American, in my dialect, open O is pronounced how? For example, L-A-W. Law, law. But in British, it's law. And in California, it's law, law. They don't have so much rounding, it's more like ah. We can still use the same symbol and everybody knows what it is. So this is not really a good excuse for not using the IPA. In other words, we're all really against ad hoc symbols. In the past, students have tried to use them. They didn't know it wasn't KK, and they were totally confused. They say, Lao Su, it's a Yeah, OK. And then there's more on dictionaries, the Oxford Dictionary of Pronunciation. Dun, dun. We don't really need that. 
We're now at the top of 87 at vowel quality. We can take a break. And the other thing I want to mention is a lot of you don't get what I'm saying when I talk about the qingsheng in minanyu. The reason is because a lot of you have not studied minanyu specifically as a language, or you haven't studied its um, tone system, for example. And it's very, very interesting. Mandarin has one of the simplest tone systems among the Han dialects. The Mandarin that we speak is the national language in both mainland China and Taiwan. It has one of the simplest systems. There is a system even simpler with only three tones. But Mandarin is one of the simplest. And another reason Mandarin was chosen is because for centuries it has been the language of government and culture. So there are a lot of good reasons why Mandarin was chosen. It really is easier to learn. Some dialects are devilishly complicated. If you want to learn the tone system, for example, of forget it. It's just crazy. A specialist in the zhuanjia, he said, So that's one reason we did not choose Fuzhouhua as a Guoyu. It's very complex. And we don't need all that complexity. For a language you want everybody to speak, no matter what their home dialect is, you want something that's fairly easy to learn. And Mandarin is honestly quite easy to learn compared to a lot of these. So you're familiar with Mandarin, but you haven't received the same conscious training in Minayu, most of you. Some of you have. Jerome, how do you know what you know? Uh, I, I read the, uh, uh, the internet and from, my, from, from my father. From your father? Yeah, because my, my father has a dictionary of Taiwanese. OK. Yeah, and I like to read such a kind of dictionary because it's very interesting about the you're pretty lucky, actually, that you have a father like that who's interested in that. I have about eight dictionaries of Taiwanese. I have a lot. I've collected them over the years. I've stopped recently. But I have a lot of very thick dictionaries of Minayu. And I studied it. There's a course that I use. It's one of the best language courses I've taken for any language. It's called Simply Taiwanese. And it was put out by the Marino fathers. Jiabana. So Marino, those are the publishers. They're Marino. You can find the book in the library. If you want to, if you're interested, go to the library and look for it. It's called Simply Taiwanese. There are three volumes, and there are a lot of Kasha Luin Dai with it. I've got them at home. Next semester we'll probably do some Ji in in Minayu. We haven't done Mandarin yet. We are before the end of the semester, the IPA, the But this is one of the really one of the best language courses I've taken for any language. It's very, very well done. I used to listen to it on the way to the Xinwenju. I read the textbook at home and listened to the tapes on the way. Um, so if you want to know how it works, this this series, the three books, explain it very, very clearly. And in order to understand the neutral tone, you first have to understand the Taiwanese tone system. And if you don't know it, you should learn it. You are Taiwanese, right? Everybody here, except for me. <laughs> I'm the only one, and I know more about it than you do, OK? But that's because I studied it. Um, doesn't mean I speak Minayu well. But I know, I know how the tone system works, and that's how I found out about the neutral tone system. And it's very interesting, because like I said, Beijing Hua has a very highly developed neutral tone system. Minayu ye yo si xiang dang de yan jin fa da de yi ge qing sheng de yi ge xi tong. But Taiwan Mandarin does not. So a lot of the things in Taiwan Mandarin people blame on Minayu. This is mei dao li de shi. In many ways, in fact, there's a guy who's xiang dang lu de yi ge peng yao. Fei zhang lu ah. He has written a whole article about the similarities between Beijing Hua and Minayu. Isn't that strange? Isn't that strange? Because I think this is my personal opinion about why it happened. Beijing Hua and Minayu, they are both natural languages. They're just the way people speak. Now for us, But for people from Beijing, this is is Beijing Hua. So their language grew up naturally, and then the qingsheng developed naturally. We say that 
Beijing Mandarin has a trochaic rhythm. Trochaic. If you know that from literature, trochaic. Anybody know? Yeah. You remember from Dai Yingwen? Good for you. Good. That's a Wai Xi the Dai Yingwen. Dai Zhi Dao Ei. How bang. Okay. How? Da 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 da. Just like gobo, lobo. That's trochaic. 前面很清楚，后面是轻声。Da da da da. We say that Beijing Mandarin has a trochaic rhythm. Taiwan Mandarin, does it have a trochaic rhythm? Luobo, gobo. No, Taiwan Mandarin does not have a trochaic rhythm. This is Beijing Mandarin. Taiwan Mandarin has not really been satisfactorily analyzed. Is it a syllable time language? It is, a, is it a stress time language? I want you to think about that. I have my own personal answer to this. That's another thing to put in your notes with the Minan Yu. I want you to think about it. And this is when you just have to introspect about yourself. You're all native speakers of Mandarin. Maybe you learned Minan Yu first, but you're all native speakers of Mandarin. I want you to put, put it in your notes. Assignment, assignment. You now know what stress timed and syllable timed is, right? English is what? Stress or syllable timed? Stress. Like, Ding dong bell, but killed the mice in his father's barn, right? That's an example of a stress time language. And syllable time means each syllable, like French. Now, is Mandarin more stress timed or is it more syllable timed? I want you to think about that. Put it in your notes for Monday. And I'll write it down so I remember to check. Okay? I want you to think about it. And the answer is not very danchuan. I have my own answer. People are still doing research on it. So they found it, it is also not so straightforward. I want you to think about it. What's your panduan as a speaker of Mandarin? You can listen to Mandarin everywhere and be a, an excellent judge because your mingan du is perfect. So I want you to think about, would you classify Taiwan Mandarin more as a syllable time language or as a stress time language and why? Give, give us proof. Give us an example why you think so. Okay. Anyway, what I was saying, that if you want to be able to do this assignment that I've just given you, finding out about the Qingsheng and Minayu, the first thing you need to know is Minayu, the Sheng Diao Xi Tong. How many tones in Southern Min? You're not sure. You really have to do some work. You have to do some work. As Taiwanese, you have, this, you have some work to do. In addition to the, this number of tones, which I won't say right now, each tone turns into something else. I'll just give you a, a very small example. 我 in Minayu is good. How do you say 我是? All right, what happened to the tone? Okay, Jerome, I know you know. Let's see if the rest of people know. Yeah. 我, right? 我. And then 我是. What happened? Yeah, it changed. Try another tone and see what happens. Let's try 喝东西的喝. Okay, now say he cha. Okay. And then try that with lots of words. Uh-huh. Okay? D. Right. You do it. That's your job. Find out you'll find the information online easily. Every tone turns into another tone. What is the rule? Under what circumstances? Oh, that's we're giving an, an explanation, but I'm saying under what circumstances? Some qing kuang tao wei bian. Mi nan yu shi shen me qing kuang zi xia, na ge yuan lai de sheng diao hui bian ling wai ge sheng diao. Gang ge na ge li zi ni ke yi tui li chu lai. Okay, you need to find that out too. We call that tone sandi. When a tone changes into another tone in a certain environment, that's called a tone sandi. This is fan wen the good zi. By the way, bu fan wen, it's a fan wen all. <laughs> a lot of people say it with the wrong tone. Tone sandi. Just like in Mandarin, what do we have? What's the, what's the most common tone sandi in Mandarin? Liang ge san sheng, di ge bian er sheng. All right, that's, that's the one you know about because they teach it in school. But these other ones they don't teach you about. So, minan yu is full of tone sandi. Under what circumstances does a tone turn into a different tone? Okay, do your research. It's well worth it. Because you, you should know that. It's like basic cultural knowledge. It's Okay, anything else about assignments? 
before we move on? Any other questions? Okay, we really do need to move on. We're on vowel quality on page 87. Pages 86 and 85, some of you may not do it, but you should, because there may be stuff in the test, especially regarding what? Ad hoc pronunciation symbols in what kind of dictionaries? There may be a question about that. <clears throat> Not promising, but there may be. But usually when I say it's probably going to be in the test, is it usually on the test? Usually it is. Okay. We're on page 87, <clears throat> vowel quality. I'm going to summarize some of it, and then for some, maybe if we have time, I'll have people read a bit. <clears throat> In the discussion so far, we have deliberately avoided making precise remarks about the quality of different vowels. This is because, as we said in Chapter 1, the traditional articulatory descriptions of vowels are not very satisfactory. All right, going back to what we said a long time ago, which are easier to describe in terms of articulation, vowels or consonants? Consonants are much easier to describe, bilabial, nasal, mm, easy. But as for e, what's the difference between e and i? It's much harder because we can't show you exactly what to do with your tongue, where to put it. Because what you do is different from what somebody else does. All we need to do is get a certain sound quality. That's what we're after with vowels. Try asking people who know as much about phonetics as you do to describe where the tongue is at the beginning of the vowel in boy, which is o. Oi. Where is your tongue? O. It's Xuan Zai Nebian somewhere, right? Oh, oi. We know now that it's a bit back, but to say exactly where it is so someone else can produce the same vowel just by your description is really difficult. You'll get a variety of responses if you do this. Can you describe where your own tongue is? It's difficult to describe the tongue position of a vowel in one's own speech, and that's what I really felt early on in phonetics. Very often, people can only repeat what the books have told them. And that's not just true of vowels, it's true of all learning. A lot of our learning, we're just repeating what the books have told us. And I feel that strongly, having been in English education so long in Taiwan, what people know often came from books, but they don't apply what they know. And very often, what they learn from books is no longer used. For example, I'd better take an umbrella lest it rain. Everybody seems to learn lest, but nobody says lest in English. But it's still in the textbooks, at least some of them. Maybe now they're changing it. My point is that often the stuff in textbooks is dead. It's dead. Nobody has really tried it out. Because instead of putting it in practice, it's just theory to be used for what? What happens to a lot of the dead knowledge in your textbooks here in Taiwan? It's not just Taiwan, of course. There's a lot of dead knowledge. It's already changed, or maybe it's true, but the teacher himself or herself doesn't know how to apply it. For example, compound stress. Did some of you learn compound stress in school a little bit? No, not at all. Uh, some students say they learned a rule once, one day, and then they never paid attention to it after that. So some things you learn the theory of. The theory is correct, but does it get applied? Doesn't get used. So a lot of times, what we're doing in our education system, in all kinds of xiaowen, we're just mouthing, we're just parroting stuff that we've seen in books. And where did the books get it? From the previous edition. And where did the previous edition get it? from Shangu Sudai, right? So it's come down to us. A lot of it is out of date. It's untested. It is not put into practice. A lot of the knowledge in books is dead, either inaccurate or not applied. And one thing that I really, really want you to take away from this class is all of this stuff is applied. It's for application. It's not just to be dead knowledge for books. It all applies to English, all of it. OK? Um, let's see. It says that it's quite easy for a book to build up a set of terms that are not really descript descriptive, but are in fact only labels. Because we don't apply these things, we'll say that, oh, this is compound stress, or this is a high vowel that's a back vowel. 
but we don't really know what our tongue is doing. So we could just as well call it one, two, three, four, or A, B, C, D. Yeah. They only serve to identify or to distinguish one from another, right? So he's saying that of a lot of our learning, and especially in phonetics. They're just biao qian. They don't really reflect, ref, reflect reality, or people don't apply it. And in this book, he's going to repeat this many, many times. Second semester, he'll repeat it many more times. So he's saying that especially with vowels, but they don't necessarily mean a lot. They're just ABC labels, kinds of labels. Mm. We started introducing terms of this kind uh, for vowel qualities in chapters 1 and 2, and we'll continue with the procedure here, but it's important for you to remember that the terms we are using are simply labels that describe how vowels sound in relation to one another. They're just used to distinguish one vowel from another. In addition, their relative value is usually correct, but they don't tell us about the absolute values. So for example, we can with some confidence say that e is higher than i. But where exactly is e, where exactly is i? So the relative values usually are accurate. So these are relative values, and they're not extremely helpful. Somewhat helpful, but not as helpful as we maybe thought they would be. Part of the problem in describing vowels is that there are no distinct boundaries between one type of vowel and another. So we have e and i as separate vowels in English. And you have them as separate vowels in Chinese. They're not separate phonemes, but they're different vowels. So e, er, san, and i, er. They have different functions for you, right? You can hear them perfectly clearly. But those are still two different subsets. They're two different variations, two different allophones, actually, of e. But in between e and if, for example, there's an infinite number of points between them, right? Like you learn in calculus, an infinite number of points between these two points. So e takes a long time to get to i. And all of those sounds in between are potential vowels. Maybe exactly one of those points is the target vowel for another language. So it doesn't mean that e and it are set in stone. They just happen to be the vowels we use in one variety of English. Everything in between them is another possibility. Any place you put your tongue in your mouth, practically, is a potential vowel. OK? That's what they're saying here. Um, when talking about consonants, the categories are much more distinct. A sound may be a stop or a fricative, or a sequence of the two. If it's a sequence of the two, we call it a an affricate, right? Stop plus a fricative, an affricate. But it cannot be halfway between a stop and a fricative. Now, is that totally true? We can have a stop that's slowly turning into a fricative. It's sort of possible. But it's probably going to get classified as one or the other, because normally a stop, put, cut off. That's a stop. If it's put, now it's starting to turn into a fricative. So it's not really normal to have something between a stop and a fricative in, uh, for a consonant. So usually it's one or the other. Even fricative to, to approximate, we have a definition. We don't hear what? With an approximate, what do we not hear when? Like with y, we don't hear. Turbul turbulence or friction, that's right, with ye, unless it is voiceless. So ye, we hear kind of dull, but we don't really hear friction. But with now we can hear the friction. So we have a definition for distinguishing between fricatives and approximants, which are actually very similar in how they're articulated. Okay? Um, vowels are different. It's perfectly possible to make a vowel that is halfway between a high vowel and a mid vowel, which we just discussed. In theory, it is possible to make a word at any specified distance between any two other vowels in order to appreciate the fact that vowel sounds form a continuum. Excuse me. You can call it a lian shu ti or yan shu ti. I call it a yin, yan shu de yan, uh, yan shu ti, a continuum. Try gliding from one vowel to another. Let's just do it from a and then go to e. So slowly. Start with a very low front vowel, a, and go very, very slowly up to e. And listen to all the sounds in between a and e. Let's start now with a. Go. A.
all kinds of sounds in between those two vowels. All of those could be a regular you know, vowel for a certain language. Um, and he wants you to try it with, um, you should pass through sounds sounding like e eh in head and a eh in hey. And if you, didn't, if you didn't hear it the first time, try it again. Okay, I think that was enough though. Now do the same in reverse, going slowly and smoothly from e to a. Ah. Let's go from e to a. Ah. Go slowly. E okay, very good. Take as long as possible between, over the in-between sounds. You should learn to stop at any point in this continuum so that you can make, for example, a vowel like e eh, as in head, but slightly closer to e. Eh. Let's try, oh, and that's really easy for Taiwanese because you do it all the time. When you're supposed to say e, eh, you actually say something like a, eh, like bet, sounds like bat, and I keep going like this. Whenever I go like this, that means you've gone too much in the direction of a. Eh. So bet, some of you say bat, then I say put your hand up here, bet, bet. Right, but it's a possible vowel. I don't like it for English, because that's not what we do, but it's a possible vowel, okay? Um, next, try going from a in front, it's a low front vowel, to a in the back, a low back vowel. From a to a, try it. Very good. Did you recognize any of those vowels in the middle? He says you probably won't because English does not really have any monophthongs in the middle, but we have some diphthongs like I and ow. They start somewhere in the middle between a and a. So the beginning of a couple diphthongs in English, maybe if you were really looking for it, you could hear them. Some forms of Scottish English, for example, do not distinguish between the vowels in these words or between cam and calm. And I had a really wonderful example of it. It's in the Shitting Guan. I didn't bring it. But if you listen to educated Scottish English, you will hear that they do not distinguish between a and a. So how do you think they say fu qin? I want you to say yong yo yo, H A V E yo, and fu qin. Try to say both of them with the same vowel in between because that's what Scottish people do. And so instead of have, they probably say have somewhere in the middle. And instead of father, they'll say father, father, have father. It's the same vowel. Okay? But I've heard a lot of Scottish English, and it's fun because they don't distinguish those two vowels. It's all at father, father. Okay? Um, Okay, that takes care of that page. Next page, please. Some speakers of American English in the Boston area pronounce words such as car and park with a vowel between the more usual American vowels in cam and calm. Those are my vowels, cam, calm. And they have this very famous sentence. Anybody know what it is? When people want to imitate the Boston accent, they always say the same sentence with those words. Anybody know it? In fact, I lived in Boston for one semester, I went to Harvard one semester as a visiting student. And my landlady, who is Irish background, but she's from Boston, she had exactly this accent, exactly. Margaret O'Flaherty. Yeah, I wonder if she's still around. Um, and she, it sounds like this. This is the sentence. Nobody knows it offhand? Okay, if you look it up, you'll find it easily on the internet. Excuse me. <clears throat> it's, go pack your car in the Harvard yard. Go pack your car in the Harvard yard. You've got some of the words here. Go park your car in the Harvard yard. Okay, it's a bad imitation, so excuse me, Bostonians who are listening to this video. They'll say, oh, what a terrible accent. <laughs> but it gives you the idea. And I have a Boston friend, a Bostonian friend. He used to teach at the Yuen Zhongxin. His name is Eric. And he, a lot of people who speak with a Bostonian accent, when they leave Boston or when they interact with people, in a more educated class, they hurry up and get rid of their Boston accent because people make fun of it. Remember what I told you about a Texan accent? Remember that story? Okay. Well, the same is true of a very strong Boston accent. And I asked Eric, my friend, he speaks with a strong accent sometimes. And I have to say, huh? I sometimes don't understand him. But it's also very charming. I love listening to it. 
Because in America, a lot of us are pretty homogenized. So much is the same across from coast to coast. You know, the McDonaldization of culture is happening all over the world. So when you hear somebody with a different accent, at least for me, it's a lot of fun. Even though I don't always understand him, I have to say, huh, a couple times. So um, they often will try to change to a more standard accent. And I've given this example before, but somebody from Ilan, you don't say Japung in Ilan, you say Japui. And usually, at least a taxi driver told me this. When he came to Taipei, people laughed at him, so he changed his Japui into Japung. Because he would get laughed at, Muishik, things like that. His, his Ilan accent got laughed at in Taipei, so he changed. It's the same thing, exactly the same thing. All right. So if you have an accent that people kind of think is a bit too, you often will change. Um, and also, I don't know if the Boston accent is dying out. Maybe not as many people speak it, but I know it is still spoken. Mm. <clears throat> Let's see. And then we want to go from ah, that's a low back, to a high back, ooh. So go from ah to ooh very, very slowly. Try it. You should go through a lot of familiar vowels. Go. Ah. You have to add rounding. Yeah, jiao yuan swen. Oh, you should go through O oh somewhere in the middle. And it's difficult to be specific as to the vowels you'll go through because English accents differ considerably in this respect. Those vowels back there, they often differ a lot in different accents. For example, we just mentioned ah in my dialect, more ah in California, and o oh in British, like polk, lol. Right? So a lot of those vowels in the back are quite different. And I say O, oh, and in RP it's O. Oh. So those back vowels, we have quite a bit of variation in different dialects. That's it. We're to the auditory vowel space. Or, for short, we just call it the vowel space. This figure at the bottom of the page, that trapezoid, is called the vowel space. And we draw that when we want to show where the relative positions of vowels are. Um, when you move from one vowel to another, you are changing the auditory quality of the vowel. So remember when we're describing vowels, we're really describing not articulatory organs and positions, but, but, he just said, last word of the first line, auditory qualities. So for vowels, when we describe vowels, we're going to describe auditory qualities, not places of articulation. We do give places of articulation, but they're kind of murky. So actually for vowels, we rely on auditory quality. We're describing auditory qualities. We're not really saying where the tongue is. We call it high, low, front, back, etc. for convenience, but what we're really describing is the quality of the sound. It's auditory. Consequently, because phoneticians cannot be very precise, about the positions of the vocal organs and vowels. Unless we use x-ray or MRI to monitor the tongue, we often simply use labels for the auditory qualities. So we call things high, low, front, back, center, mid, whatever, for convenience, fang bian. It's what we, sort of what we do for consonants, so we do it for vowels, but it gives us a tuojue that we're talking about the tongue when we're talking about sound. We're not talking about the tongue. We're really talking about sound. Um, Okay, and the rest, I think, is just repeating what we've already said. We're going to go jump to 89. Read it over yourself, but we've really already covered it. <clears throat> None of the vowels has been put in an extreme corner of the space in figure 4.1. Well, actually, we should go over a little bit of it because we're kind of jumping in the middle. Um, let's look at this vowel space at the bottom of the page. And we say E is high front. And you can see that E is towards that point at the top, right? Everybody found E upper right hand, upper, sorry, upper left hand corner? Got it? So E, it's high and it's front. It's not all the way front, right? It's not way in that jian jiao. It's not way in there. Not quite that front. And it's not completely high either, because if it were, it'd turn into a, a yi. And we put a as low front. So it's two extremes of the front vowels. You have two extremes. We'll put those in first. Those are easy. It helps us sort of 
um, mark the boundaries of our space by picking the most extreme, the vowels in the most extreme positions. And then for low back, we have what? Ah, and then high back. Ooh, which is not really very back. We could make it more back. Try to make ooh more back. We've done it before. Try it again. Ooh, 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 ooh. It turns almost into a dark L, like full. If you make a very, very back ooh, you'll get a dark L as in full, full, with no alveolar contact, okay? Um, so none of these vowels has been put in an extreme corner. It is possible to make vowels that are more back than ooh. We just did that. More front than E, etc. And so he wants you to practice that. He wants you to say, uh, he, first of all, he's going to give you a little uh, diacritic for a very back U. He's going to put a line under it. We're now about at the end, uh, the second last line of the first paragraph on 89. So, what little symbol? Are we using here? It's a little line under the U that means a more back U. This is not really standard IPA. He's just doing this for the point he's trying to make here. So let's try making those three sounds in the series. What are they? E, U, U. That really deep back U. Okay. Mm, so U is between E and U. Similarly, similarly, it's possible to make vowels with a more extreme quality than e and a and a. So try it first with e. Make a, an even more extreme e, everybody. E. Can you feel it turning into a y sound? Yeah. And let's try for a. Let's make it even lower. Try. Ah. It sounds like a little kid, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds pretty funny. In English, too. Same as Mandarin. And then for ah, let's make that even lower and more back. Ah, ah. It's going to become pharyngeal at some point. Okay. Mm. And uh, all right, we're now in the middle of 89, third paragraph. Given a notion of an auditory vowel space of this kind, we can plot the relative quality of the different vowels. Remember that the labels high, low, front, back should not be taken as descriptions of tongue positions. They're just talking about the relation of one sound to another. Um, the next part is again about the labels again. It's mainly tradition. And there is another reason, and that is if we plot the sounds, if we plot the formants, remember formants? If we plot them out, we get the vowel space with the vowels spread around. Okay, so that's another um, reason why we use them. So if you looked at x-rays of people talking and plotted these vowels or you located the vowel from these x-rays, you would find that the positions were not quite like these vowel spaces that we draw with vowels in them. Not quite the same. But they do have the same relationships. And sometimes linguists use the terms acute, that means sharp, remember we just had that, acute, and grave. Grave means duan or dull. Acute and grave, instead of front and back. So don't, you don't need that for the test, by the way. I will not test you on that thing, that, that point. So American and British vowels, most of the vowels of a form of standard American newscaster English, typical of many Midwestern speakers, are shown in 4.2, and then we've also got the British version on page 90. It shows you both monophthongs and diphthongs, but it's got one very important vowel that's missing. And somebody asked me that many weeks ago. Both of these vowel spaces are missing one very, very important vowel. What is it? The schwa, that's right. And schwa is kind of problematic because is it really a phoneme? I suppose you could count it as one, but it's got a special status as the neutral vowel in unstressed syllables, in many unstressed syllables. Okay, but the schwa is still the most common vowel in English. Just a chushen, zui duo ci, is the schwa. Mm, okay, and we've got dots for monophthongs, and we've got these wedges for 
um, for diphthongs. And we have a jin jiao, and then we have a, a wider base. What does that mean? Because one of them is a little confusing. Can you explain why they're, um, they have a wider base and then a, a very point at the other end, a, a pointy point at the other end? You need to understand this, because otherwise it's going to confuse you. I will ask you to draw these in a test. I'm telling you right now. So practice drawing it and placing the vowels in the vowel space. And I don't mind giving away the, the question, because you need to know how to do this no matter what. And if I tell you it's on the test, you work harder at it. But I will put that in the test. So, why are they wide at one end and pointed at the other end? That's, that's the tuojue, and that will confuse you with one of the, with one of the diphthongs. It works for all of them but one. That's right. And remember, how did we distinguish these two kinds of diphthongs? Somebody besides Jerome. Jerome's giving a lot of answers now. Someone else. Remember, we had two kinds of diphthongs. What, what did we call them? Rising and? That's easy if I've told you rising and falling. Do you remember rising and falling diphthongs? Okay, let's review that. What's the difference between a rising and a falling diphthong? In the five most common, well, let's see. The ones that, the, the, the diphthongs that we usually think of when we think of diphthongs in English are what? I, A. Just go in the doing for how order. They're easy to remember that way. I, A, I, O, oh, sorry. I, A, O, O, U. No, not you. You doesn't go here. One more for English. Oi, right. Chinese doesn't have oi. Mandarin doesn't have oi. Cantonese does. Mandarin does not. So I, A, ao, O, oi, right? What kind of diphthongs are they? Are they rising or falling? And why? Why? Okay, that's not what we mean by rising and falling, and that's why I'm mentioning it so you clarify it in your head. If, we're, if we have a falling diphthong, we're going from a more prominent to a less prominent vowel. 一个比较显著的vowel到另外一个比较不显著的vowel. That's a falling diphthong. So, I, what is, which is more prominent, the I part or the E part? I. Is I more po is A more prominent or is the E more prominent? Ah, you need to know that for English. And it's true of Chinese. Remember the I A O O, the tone mark goes on the left, right? Everybody following me? Hi, P. Now you got a hundred. You got a hundred this time. Okay, so you know. So I A O O, the tone mark goes on the left. That's the main vowel. So that's the more prominent one. That's the main vowel. And it's true of English as well. So if we're starting from a more prominent vowel, and then we're drifting off to a less prominent vowel, it's falling down. Okay? So That's called a falling diphthong. So we have five falling diphthongs, I, A, O, 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 I, and then we have one rising diphthong, which is U. Which is more prominent in this case? The U. And that's why it's rising. It's going from a less prominent sound to a more prominent sound. And that explains why U is so strange. Because the E, the Y sound is on the left. It's got the point. It goes to the more prominent U, and it's thicker. So now it makes sense, right? Kaima, if it's not clear, somebody hurry up and raise your hand, because the bell's going to ring in a second. You need to know this for the test as well, because 你们画的时候,这个哪一边比较宽,哪一边是尖头,那个要画对. And you need to know that U is different from the other five. U is rising, the other five are falling. Prominent to, more pro to less prominent is falling. Less prominent to more prominent is rising. That's all clear? Okay, Ma. Let's continue. 
we can at least get to 91. Mm. All right, and we also know that we use a special symbol for I and ow. We don't use, we don't use the a ah because it's too back. I and ow, they're more in the center. We ran into it probably when we were going from a to a. Ah. So we use that separate symbol. It's an a ah more in the center, like ping an the an. That's a good way to ding wei. Zhong wen the ping an the an, 就是 I 跟 ow 的开头的大概的位置 Did you hear? If you understood what I said, you should write it down because it's really useful. Okay, 中文平安的安 Everybody say 安 An. All right. Now take the 嗯啊 Just say the vowel. 平安平安啊 That 啊 is about the starting point of I and ow in English. It's also the vowel that you'll hear in, for example, Texas. Instead of I like it, it'll be I like it. I like it. Oh, and that's also a horrible accent. I hate hearing. Okay, but anyway, that's how they do it. Lock instead of like. 它是从双母音变单母音，它就是把后面去掉，剩下的就是这个啊，而不是这个啊。中文平安的安就让你很容易找到那个东西，那个地方，那个音。嗯、um, ，Let's finish the paragraph and then we're done. Um. It says that although different varieties of English will differ in some aspects, especially in vowels, the majority of the relationships are the same. So, English English, its mother tongue will be a little different. For example, hand in American, hand in British, its mother tongue will be a little different. But the mother and the mother, the relationship between them is the same. Just that one is shorter or higher, or one is higher or lower, or one is lower or lower, or one is lower. 可是互相之间的那个 relative relationship stays the same. And it says we'll note cases in which there are substantial differences as we discuss the individual vowels. We've already talked about individual vowels, but we're going to do it again. And I expect to finish this in two more two more hours. So 下一次搞不好我们就念得完 We're going really fast. And if we do, though,、um, we will have a little time to. First of all, to sing on Christmas, and then also to go over things that you want more work on, you want to spend more time on. So I would recommend you start looking at the vowel allophones. But if you find you really don't understand it, you 如果真的看不懂，现在还不要写，因为你抄了等于白抄，因为不懂。等到你开始有点懂的时候再抄，你可以等。But 要有心理准备。呃、uh, ，you need to copy them by hand. But how many are there? They go up to page 102. How many allophonic rules are there for English vowels? Only six. No big deal. So when you copy it, I want you to do it when you understand what's going on, not just copying letters. There's no point in that. And also, I recommend starting to do the exercises. The exercises here, actually, I want you to be exhaustive. They say, I want you to find a certain kind of phonotactic pattern. 那你要把所有的有这个 sequence 的英文字找出来。So what tool are you going to use? One look. One look is really useful. You can find just about everything there that you need. So I would recommend start looking at the allophones and look at the exercises. Maybe do some that are easy. Do the easy ones first, and then what's left won't be so bad. I think we will finish pretty quickly. We will be able to finish all five chapters before the end of the semester. Please review everything. You will be tested mostly on the last two chapters for the final exam, but I will also include material from the whole course, from the tutorials, from the web pages, from class discussions. Okay, don't feel overwhelmed. High is a key element, but you need to know the other stuff. And we're still going to be doing probably、um, compound noun stress. 那个要注意，所以英语教学死角复合名词重音那篇要要要注意看，就是要嗯、um, 仔细的看。I think that's it. I told you at the beginning of the class the assignments. Does anybody have any questions? TAs, do you have anything that you thought of that I forgot? We're all okay. That's it. We're done. We'll see you on Monday.